All right, um, so I would like to start now. Good, um, this should be quick today um, because it's only at the rest of uh, Tuesday and the last and the next homework uh, should be done in an hour, but I was wrong at these times, uh, so I wouldn't say anything about this. Okay, um, last week's homework, um, the matplotlib tasks. Um, yeah, these tasks are always hard and always annoying. Um, I hate them too because uh, I get a lot of messages, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and I hate Windows. And there's so much stuff which went wrong on Windows again, but well, no way I want that. So Rüdiger told you that you have to install my project like this. It didn't work for some of you again, um, but then maybe worked on Travis because Travis, Travis uses Linux. Um, really annoying, but we should, uh, that should be the last task where this happens because well, Matplotlib is the, um, so we have at least two more lectures about uh, something which plots, but these plotting libraries work differently than matplotlib and work fine, hopefully just fine on Windows. And for everything which doesn't plotting, it's not as annoying. Um, so yeah, at first, so if I run the PyTest, so this is the sample solution, um, but I did some things wrong on purpose such that the PyTest fails. Well, first of all, what do we see? Um, we see nothing and that shouldn't be the case because we have this, um, our test program sh should show a window of the original plot and um, well, of your plot and the expected plot. Why doesn't this work here? Well, because I told Matlopit to use the uh, egg backend, um, which doesn't render the plots. So uh, Rüdiger told you already um, quickly about Matplotlib backends. Um, I also posted a link to uh, frequently asked questions of Matplotlib and Safe, where they explain backends in a bit more detail. And I also uploaded um, an IPython notebook file of um, which backends work in Jupyter. Um, so with this FAQ, the link is also in the, um, in the IPython notebook I added and try out a few backends. Some backends render stuff, some backends don't, some backends work in Jupyter, some don't. Um, but if we remove um, the fact that it should use the um, AGG backend, now I see the, our comparison plot here. Um, and this is how it's supposed to look. If you didn't have this window, it should be a real hard task because this pixelized comparison is really, really useful. If you didn't have that, I'm really, really, really sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, so what do we see now? My, my plot uh, still, well, it looks like the expected plot, um, but it's not 100% the expected plot. There's some differences here, and this was the problem that the fonts on Windows don't align. I hope I can fix this by simply activating the environment because I was not in the environment here, and I had matplotlib from a different source, not from this source. So for install matplotlib from this Conda Forge, which I did inside my environment, and I run PyTest again, um, the first one runs fine, as we see here. So it didn't say fail, in, it, didn't say, uh, it didn't write a red F, but instead a green dot, so the first one passed. Um, what did we do in the first one? Well, we made a histogram. Um, as you saw here, the maximum number is 0.4, even though it's a histogram, so obviously we need the density. And bins is auto because matplotlib, well, this is how matplotlib wants to make the bins if we set it to auto. Um, in all of these tasks, you were never supposed to randomly guess numbers. So if you thought you would need to randomly guess numbers, 0 0.7 hmm, doesn't work, 0 0.75 hmm, doesn't work, 0 0.749 maybe. So you were never supposed to do this. I hope we, uh, maybe we didn't make that clear enough. But you never had to guess numbers, so in this case, you just set bins auto and let um, matplotlib guess the numbers for you. Yes? But did you install it from the Condorforge? Okay, like I said, Windows sucks. I really hate this task for Windows machines. Um, go ahead, do it. This task just sucks. So if you feel uh, unfairly handled, just send me your code. I will do that manually. Would it be nicer if you send it to me before the deadline such that we can work on it together? Um, but yeah, for this task, it's really fine because it's just so shitty. Um, but yeah, 
even if it doesn't look like it's correct on Windows, it may still be correct um, on Travis, which is what counts. Yes? But, uh, what do you mean you were adding no prefixes? Because I sent you my code yesterday night. Yeah, but I fixed it, didn't I? I didn't do that. No fixes. Then text me again. I, I think I answered you. Um, but yeah, text me again. Um, like I said, this should be just fine. Okay. Um, oh yeah, by the way, really important thing. Um, if you send me emails, me or Rudiger emails concerning with questions to your code, please don't, please don't attach the code or don't attach screenshots or something. Just make a new commit on GitHub. I told that to everybody who sent me an email already, but I need to tell that to everybody. So please send me an email. Uh, please make a commit and push that commit to GitHub and send me an email with your repository link in there such that I can simply clone your repository and have that locally for me. That makes it way easier than uh, sending the code and it's just a well, way better um, style. Okay, so yeah, if I use PyTest outside the environment, the, fo the font was wrong. If I use it inside the environment, the font is just fine. Um, what we didn't tell you so far is that you can also run PyTest. So yeah, let's close that for a second. You can also run PyTest for only a specific, um, for only uh, one function. And we can run PyTest. So if we simply run PyTest, it tries to find all test underscore mm -hmm, Python files. And in these test underscore mm -hmm, Python files, it tries to find all test underscore mm -hmm, um, functions. So we see in our directory here, there's one test underscore something file, which is these test plots. So PyTest will go for these test plots. And in these test plots, um, it won't care for this, for this, for this, because they don't have test underscore something, but it will go for the test underscore histogram, test underscore temperature, inferno, and bar plot. So this is what, Py, what PyTest does. It opens these functions and um, just uh, well, runs them, and then checks if all the assert statements um, well, are true. And if they're not, it will tell you so, um, which it did for me here. And it helped me, well, there's an assertion error because compare plots rainfall is false. It would return true if there would be the same plots. They aren't, so false, assertion error, PyTest fails. If you want to test only one function, you can um, test, you can run PyTest with, uh, as argument, the name of the file and then colon, colon, the name of um, the function you want to test. So if I want to run only, if I want to test only the bar plot, I can PyTest, test plots, test bar plot, and now it won't show all the next, all the other cases, but only the bar plot here. Um, okay. Yes, so like I said, um, sometimes, so for Windows users, it sometimes didn't work on Windows, but it did work on, uh, on Travis. And how can you check um, what the error on Travis is? I think we showed that already in the first lecture, but now that you're a bit comfortable with, um, with all this stuff, let's do it again. So imagine this was my homework directory, and I accepted the homework here, and then the green mark should be here. And if it isn't, I can simply click this, and this then opens the window of um, my CI, which is Travis, um, telling me, well, that some tests failed. So this is wrong. I can now go to this build, which is simply the build Travis made for that. And now it can't find the repository because I need to log in into Travis. Um, if you're logging in uh, for the first time to Travis, you need to, um, uh, you need to authorize Travis for GitHub. You need to authorize again. You need to open GitHub pseudomode. Just do everything. Just enter your password as many times as you need to. Um, believe me, Travis is legit. So yeah, and once I entered my password, I'm here. And now this is, you won't see all these because I see, um, I see the commits of all of the repositories, you only see yours. And then you see the job log here. And so Travis uses Docker, so at first it builds up a Docker container um, containing some Linux distribution, blah, blah, blah. Then it clones your repository here, as we see. This is where it clones your repository. And then it simply runs PyTest. And so from this PyTest on, you can, so then it installs your requirements, which is why the requirements of TXT file is in there. Then it runs PyTest, and then I can look at the PyTest here. So PyTest tells me there's an assertion error here, there's an assertion error here, here, and here. So in this task, the PyTest won't tell you too much, 
because when it simply compared the plots and you need to look at the window for all the other tasks, where the PyTest error message is really informative. In this case here, it tells me your function did not return a figure object. Um, and then it tells me what, the, so these are the lines um, which worked fine. The lines which are yellow are the ones which work as fine. And then the red ones are the ones which were through the error. And it tells me what the error is. It's in a search and error. And the text of this error is that a function did not return a figure object. And then it tells me assert false, where false is, and then this here. So if I open that in um, the test file, so Okay, so it tells me that um, this is instance, blah, blah, blah. So this is this line. This test asks if um, what your module dot make inferno image returns, uh, this result figure, is in fact of type matplotlib dot figure dot figure. We're supposed to return a figure. Okay, and it tells me you didn't do so because this assertion here um, yields false. And what is this? Well, this assertion is this stuff, this is instance, is instance call, yeah? Checking if it was, if this result figure is this, and where the result figure was none because we returned none, and then it tells me, well, this is an error. So what we're supposed to do here is, well, return a figure such that. So this, te this test, if I read the error message carefully, tells me I returned none, because it tells me here um, where false is, is in this instant call with as argument here a none, result figure is none. I didn't return a figure, but I returned none. So yeah, that's not the case uh, for this because there's some position which doesn't, which doesn't return one, but this would be the result if we simply forgot the return statement in the end. Um, can I, this screen. And so if I didn't, in the Inferno image, if I forgot to return the figure in the end, then it would tell me a search and error, none. Okay, so as much for how you read the Travis error messages. Yeah, okay, um, now I don't see anything on the screen again. This is really annoying. Okay, there you go. So, as much for how it looks on Travis, let's go through our sample solution again. So, the bar plot now works. Next thing I have wrong here, which is a common error many of you had, is that it looks like this. Um, this is because I wanted to try out the tight layout and the solution doesn't. So, you were, like I said, you were never asked to um, put in random numbers. But I also didn't say, uh, tell you to um, put it in a tight layout. So instead of trying random numbers for the alignment or something, just try to remove the tight layout. So this was this um, was the temperature plot. So let's remove the tight layout here. And we see it already looks much better. Um, only thing, I think that's the most common error you guys had, <laughs> at least the ones um, which told it to me, where well, the text is still a bit off. And why is the text still a bit off? Because there's a space between the temperature and the degree Celsius here and here isn't. I don't know why so many of you had that wrong. That's actually, I mean, if you had the font issue in Windows, blah, 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 I can imagine. Okay, never mind, I take it back. I can understand why so many had that wrong. Okay, yeah, so temperature in degree Celsius. Let's make a space there. And now it should be correct. So now the second one passes too. So what did, what did we do here? So um, let me show you that in my interactive kernel. So let's import all this stuff here. And then make the city data. So now we have the city data, and this is the data you got, right? And the city data is simply a dictionary, Osnabrück, and then a 2D list, a 2D number array, um, with the lowest and the highest temperature of 12 months and the same for 20. Okay, so what did we do with this data? 
Well, first of all, we created um, a new plot. Um, so this is what the call would look like. So and this make temperature plot is called with the city data here, blah, blah, blah. So with the temperature data here, which is imported from this um, data thingy. So there's this data file, right? So if we look here, there's a data.py, which has this temperature data. I import that into my plots.py file here, and I just run that because Atom has this interactive kernel, like I showed you in the first um, lecture. And then I just show you a bit, like this is just to show you, this is how the input of this function looked like. Okay? I will show you um, PyCharm and a debugger in a future session, because this looks, just looks so much better than a debugger, but interactive kernels are fine for showing purposes too. Okay, and then we made um, the month, so there are 12 months, so let's make simply an np.a range um, from 0 until 11. Doesn't matter if you make from 0 until 11, from 1 until 12, from 100 until 111, doesn't matter at all as long as you um, have the tick labels correctly. Okay, and what we do then is we go through the city.items, which then yields me Osnabrück and this array, as well as Twento and this array, and then plot both of these on the first axis and on the first axis and the second axis. Okay, so what do we want to plot? Well, on the x-axis, we want to have the month, so 0, 1, 2, 3 until 11, or 1 until 12, or whatever you want to. And on the second one, you want to have, well, on the upper plot, as we asked here, the upper plot is supposed to have the load temperature, which is um, the first column here of every array. And the high temperature was the second, which was supposed to be on the second axis. So let's look at, um, so this temperature data, temperature data is basically first, well, it's the same as this one. If we go through the items, right, it's first Twento and then colon one and then Osner, uh, it's first Osnabrück colon zero and then Twento and then colon one. Do you even see that? Is that too dark? So this is, so I make, um, so this is what this temperature data oops, will look like um, in one loop, right? So it will go for, so this temperature data at the position colon O will look like this if we go through it. So this is now, it takes Osnabrück and takes the first, so the zeroth basically column, right? And then if I want to have the um, first or the second, column from Osnabrück, I call it like this. And if I loop over it, um, I go through ctdata.items. Okay, so then um, we plotted already a lot. What we now need to do, well, um, the upper one doesn't have x ticks, as we see here, so let's remove the x ticks. Um, but it does have this title, it does have this y label, and it just has the title low. The second one does have x ticks, um, but it's x ticks labels where they go from 1 until 12, whereas my month array here is 0 until 11. Like I said, it could be 100 until 111, doesn't matter. I can simply set the x ticks labels and manually set them to a range from 1 until 12. So I set the x ticks. I set there are, so the x ticks says there are 12 x ticks, and I want you to display the ones well, from 0 until 11, and I plotted from 0 until 11 here, which then tells me, well, plot every, like, show everything I wanted to plot here, right? So because this here, the x ticks, is what we plotted here, it shows me all values. And then the labels are just arbitrary stuff. I could put in there cheesecake, cu cu cheesecake cucumber, doesn't matter. Um, and I can just put, well, a range from 1 until 12. So it doesn't matter if I plot it to the same thing. The labels are just a new thing. Yeah, and then both of these wanted to have a legend. If I simply said ax.legend, it put it automatically in the correct position. So like I said, we didn't ask for parameters, and, but we did explicitly say you were supposed to plot it from, um, from negative five to 30 degrees. So you set the y limit from negative five to 30. This is the super title, and we're done. So this doesn't fail anymore. Okay, next up, um, this bar plot. So the bar plot, 
um, was, okay, that actually was, I think, the most common error because the error many of you got was not this one, this is the kitty, but this one. And now that's a really mean thing, I'm really sorry for that. So this looks like there are only two bars different. But if we zoom in, again, really sorry that we didn't mention that. How can I zoom again? Never mind, if I just increase the size of the picture, I see that all three of these bars were different. Really sorry um, that it, like this is anti-aliasing, the computers just do that sometimes. So yeah, if you thought there would be two errors wrong, there were in fact three errors wrong. Okay, so why are these three errors, um, three bars wrong? Um, let's look at the code. So I added that as a hint yesterday, and everybody who asked that, I answered them. So really sorry that we didn't have that before, but okay, let's go for this. So first of all, we want to make a new figure, and then we sort our data here. So let's go uh, do it visually again. So what does this sorted look like? Well, we want to have, we want to sort in reverse, right? We want to have the highest number at the front, which is Bielefeld, and we want to sort this data.items, so we make from this data dictionary, we make a, two, we make a, a list, data.items, and then we sort them by the second element, which is the amount of rainfall. So if we do that, we get this sorted list, Bielefeld with 906 meters per, per, uh, per square meter, then Köln, and so on and so on. So this is already, as we see, in the order we want to have it. Okay, and then what we can do is we can extract the cities and the values using zip. I showed you that in the second or third lecture. So zip just changes, um, well, it just zips. So if I have it like this, I have a 2D list, which gives me city rainfall, city rainfall, city rainfall. If I zip that, if I depack it with the um, star operator and then zip it, it gives me city, 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 um, rainfall, rainfall, rainfall. And if I zip that again, it would be city, rainfall, city, rainfall again. If I zip that, that, if I zip that again, city, 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 rainfall, rainfall, rainfall. Zip is really useful if you want to unpack stuff. So um, if we execute this, we get the cities and the, what do you mean? We get the cities and the values both in the, yeah, shut up both in the correct order. So, oops. we did need to sort the cities just as we had to sort um, the rainfall amount. Um, we could just sort that, like we could arc sort, the, so we could split the cities and the rainfalls before and then we could arc sort the rainfall and then take the cities in the order of the rainfall. That would be a possibility. But it's easier to just sort the entire thing and then extract the cities in the correct order and the um, values in the correct order. So like I said, dictionaries are not sorted, so we can't rely on dictionaries being sorted. But this here is a list. The resulting thing here is a list. And well, if I zip it, so this is a zip object, which is also sorted. Um, and we see that the cities are still sorted in the correct order. So Bielefeld, Köln, Hamburg, Hannover, and so on. OK, um, I use NumPy to take the mean. I plot the mean using this um, horizontal line. So the label is the one which shows here in the legend. And then I run ax.bar and I can simply plot cities against values. So please plot me on the x-axis. I want all the cities and the height of that is supposed to be the values. So this is how we call this ax.bar. And then I make them all steel blue. So we said that you were supposed to color them in RGB 255.99.71 and the other one in this hash 4682b4. Um, the first one is simply steel blue and the second one is tomato. Doesn't matter at all, you don't need to know that. Um, you can also just insert this color here instead of the steel blue and the tomato. You can also use the RGB triple, Rudiger told you all about this color thing is. Or you can just, for example, if you, you could also use an online RGB to um, hexadecimal numbers String whatever converter to convert this into hexadecimal number string, blah, blah, blah. In the end, it were the color steel blue and tomato. doesn't matter at all for you. Okay, so I plot these, and if I use the whatever this x that bar returns, I get the artists, which we really told you last week, so I get the artists for this bars here. And so, yeah. Now, as we saw here, um, 
So the ones I colored steel blue are wrongly colored because like this outside here is missing. And if you look really closely, the expected plot had some really tiny line around here which is not steel blue. Why not? Because we only colored the insides of the bars. We didn't color the edge of the bars. There's a second argument, edge color. And if I set that too, I would be fine because then it would um, color the inside and the outside. And now, well, the kitty is still wrong, but um, the bar plot is correct as we see here. Bar plot is correct. Okay? So we have to color the inner color and the edge color. That was the second way to do that. So let me show you the second way too. Um, so what you needed to do afterwards anyway is to then go through all these artists and you can zip these with the values again. And um, what does this look like if we zip the artists and the values? Well, like I just told you, we get this. Um, so if we zip the bars and the values, this gives me a list of, well, this bar and the corresponding value, and this bar, and the corresponding value, and so on and so on. And we wanted to change the color of the bars if the corresponding value um, was under this, under the mean. So then we went through all the bars, and if the height of the bars was smaller than our mean, then we changed the color. So this changes only the color of these bars. And if we didn't change the edge color, what we could do now is we could just simply set um, the other bars are green, um, steel blue again. So if we didn't have the color argument here at all, and I did it like this, it would be fine as well. Um, what? Do we have an unindent here? Uh, yeah, kitty fails, um, but the bar here is fine, as we see. Okay, so. If I change the artists afterwards, it changes the color as well as the edge color. If I call the AX the bar, um, it only changes the inner color, not the edge color. Another possibility is to set, um, where you don't even need to change the artists afterwards, is to well, have a number array of um, the colors. So my color is now a number array of colors of the same length as the number of bars with the, with, with the correct color strings. So the first ones are steel blue and the rest ones are tomato. And I could then simply use this color string here um, as color as well as edge color. So this was, would have worked just as well. Okay, yeah, and then um, this Y label is, um, the string contains this um, LaTeX fraction, and because there's a backslash in there, I need to go for the escape string, which is this R string, which just doesn't care for backslashes. If you use LaTeX inside a string, you need to have it as an R string. Then we need to set the X ticks labels at the correct positions with the correct rotation and horizontal alignment, show the legend, and we're done. Good, last thing was the Inferno Kitty. Um, well, that was real quick, so important, we need to use the color map Inferno, we need to set the V mean and V max, because what happened if we didn't do that, well, it plotted it from zero until 255, instead of zero until one, which made every single pixel besides the one which happened to um, lay on the same, uh, which have the same value due to the fixed point sets, um, are wrong. So we have to tell the matplotlib bm show explicitly where there's a vmin and a vmax. So let's do that. And now if we execute that again, we see when moving the x ticks and the y ticks looks white, but we still have this, um, if you see it from, from there, this black border around it. So setting the x ticks and the y ticks is not the right solution. You were supposed to turn off the x's. Um, turn the axis off, and where there's a command to turn the axis off, which is simply, well, axis off, which turns the axis off, and as soon as we do that, our kitty passes too. Yay, good. Any questions to the homework? No. Then let me go through the stuff we didn't do on Thursday. Pandas, blah, 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 import pandas.
Okay, end of Tuesday lecture, so let's go here. Um, there was one thing I forgot on Tuesday, where well, I just couldn't fit in there, and I couldn't fit in, couldn't fit it in there too, uh, today too. So imagine I had this data frame, right? It has two columns, they're named A and B, and they have these values in there, and I wanted to rename the column B. Hint, hint, you may want to do that for the homework. Actually, you don't need to do that for the homework, I think. But if you want to, you can simply uh, call df.rename, and then have this mapper argument, which is a dictionary, old name to new name, access equals columns, we want to rename the columns, and then it renamed this B column into a C column. Okay, I don't even need to tell it the, this mapper, I can just have this, um, this um, dictionary, old column name, new column name as first argument, I renamed the column. Okay, you may need that for the homework. Okay, universal functions and aggregation. Um, we had both of this stuff already in NumPy, and I said in Pandas it's almost the same besides this one or two caveats. Okay, so like in NumPy, aggregation functions are functions where one or more dimensions is collapsed onto a single value. So if I take the mean of 10 numbers, I get one number, so I decrease the dimension um, from, well, a one-dimensional array to a scalar. Okay, and all these are the set operations and they generally exclude missing data because pandas is for data sets and if you have missing data in, a, um, in your data set, pandas doesn't care about that and doesn't, doesn't take the infinite or not a number values into account when calculating the mean or something, or even when counting them. Okay, so let's go for series. Let's make a new series, which is simply, well, A and A squared. So the index is simply zero until six and the value is zero until six squared and I can simply call sum, and it will return the sum of this. So it collapsed the dimension to one, so it used to be a series, now, which is one-dimensional, now it's zero-dimensional, let's scale up. Okay, how does it look for data frames? So let's make a data frame where we have A squared in the A column and A squared in the B column. And if we take the mean, what does it do? Well, it takes the mean column-wise. So it tells me the mean of the A column here is this, and the mean of the B column here is this. I can make that explicit by telling it x is equals zero, which is the same as x equals rows. Okay, so if I say x equals rows, but well, it takes the mean over all these rows um, of the column and over all these rows of the other column. So x equals zero is literally the same as x equals rows. Can I also calculate the mean of each row? Yes, I can. I can simply call df.mean with x equals one or x equals columns. Now I calculated the mean, the mean of all columns. So of zero and zero, of one and one, of four and eight, so this should be six, of nine and 27, which should be 18, obviously, and so on and so on. So um, for the aggregation functions, simply specify if you want to do it by column or by row, and pandas will do so for you. Yeah, so these are like the aggregations, let me increase the font size, by the way, which are in pandas, So we can take, we can count the number of items. You may need that in the homework. We can take the first and last items, mean and median, mean and max, standard deviation variance, mean absolute deviation. I have no clue what that means right now, but maybe you need it for statistics. The product of all items and the sum of all items in case it is um, an, uh, um, a column or row of numbers. And if not, you need to convert it to numbers. We had that already. So these are all methods of the data frame series. So I can call the, um, MAD, whatever that means, df.mad. So this is the mean absolute deviance of the two columns. If I knew more about statistics, I could tell you what this value meant. Um, okay, as much for aggregations, which collapse one dimension um, to lesser dimensions, dimensions to lesser dimensions. Universal functions, um, we know already from NumPy. So universal functions are vectorized functions that change all values of an array simultaneously. Um, Pandas does the same, but the nice thing about pandas is where well, everything has indices. And pandas preserves this index and the column labels for data frames, which is really useful because I can simply, for example, if I have um, arrays of different size, but they have matching indices, pandas will automatically align indices and add um, the correct cells to the correct cells. Let's show um, what I mean by that. So let's simply create a new data frame. So it has columns A, B, C, D, and rows one, two, three. And if I take the exponent of 
uh, so e to the power of all those elements, it's a universal function that will take the exponent of every single cell. Okay, so what do I mean by this index alignment? So pandas will align indices in the process of performing the operations. So imagine we had um, this area series and this population series. We see that the area series contains Alaska, Texas, and California, whereas the population series contains California, Texas, and New York. So there's one element which is in the first one, and there's one element which is in a button on the second, and there's an element which is in the second button on the first. Um, I already told you last week that the pandas index, index object, so whatever series or data frame dot index, you can do set operations on them, and well, what are all the values which are in both of these series? Well, Texas and California. So there's California in the first one, there's Texas in the first one, there's California in the second one, and Texas in the, in the second one. So the ones where both in the, the rows where both indices align are California and Texas. So now, if I divide the area by population to um, take the um, population density, um, it will tell me, well, I can do that for California and Texas, um, but for Alaska and New York, I have, as a result, not a number, because, well, I wouldn't know what the area of California is, no, the area of, of New York is, or what the population of Alaska is. So it can't do that, and it aligns the indices, it tells me, well, these two I know, these two I can't do. Okay, so if I divide area by population, we remember this is Python magic, so this is a Dunder method internally, which is basically the same as this divide function, so this pandas.dataframe has the method divide, and if I call this here, this internally calls the Dunder method, underscore, underscore, divide, underscore, underscore, which calls the divide without the underscore method for convenience. Okay, so this here is the same. So area by area divided by population is the same as calling area dot divide with the argument population, which results in this. However, what's the advantage of calling the function explicitly? Well, I can give additional arguments, and I can Google pandas data frame divide pandas data frame divide and I can look into the pandas documentation, and it will tell me that this divide function has an access argument and a fill value, and like this level argument and a fill value argument. And what does it tell me? Fill the not, not a number values, blah, 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 with this value before computation. Okay, so what do I expect from this? Um, well, it fills the not a number, so it um, basically our population, our area series has not a number as we cite for New York and our population, so area has not a number for New York and population has not a number for Alaska. So if it fills it before setting them, I once have a division of whatever number divided by zero and I once have a division of zero by some number. So if I have this fill value, um, Texas, uh, no, New York gives me a zero because it's zero divided by a proper value. And Alaska gives me an infinity because I have something divided by zero, which pandas can't handle and says it's infinity. Okay, so something divided by zero in pandas is infinity. That's a bad thing. We don't have, want to have infinity in a data set. How can we move this infinity? Well, the smartest way is to simply replace all infinities and negative infinities by not a number at first, and then call the function I told you already last week, which is, uh, or last Tuesday, drop not a number. So we replace the infinities by not a number and then drop these. And this then drops this infinity um, row from a data set. Um, this is obviously not the correct thing for this very thing because it says me New York has a population density of zero. Instead, I should only go for this um, one where it tells me, well, I don't know this and I don't know this, do something about it. Or I could drop an A of um, the result here. So this would be the correcter way because the zero here would be really wrong. Okay. Um, that for CVS and now for data frames, it's the same thing. The index are aligned. So our A is a data frame, which has as columns A and B and as rows one and two, zero and one, I mean, and B 
So data frame has having columns A, B, C, and rows 0, 1, 2. And if I add them, simply A plus B, pandas will align the indices and give me not a number for everything which, well, doesn't have a smart value because A didn't have a column C or row 2. It will tell me I don't know the value for these. So I could do the same thing again. I could run A dot add. I hope I can. Yes, I can. And then it will give me, like, it will fill the A here with zeros such that this is 5919 stays the same, 5919. All right. Um, so index alignment, really important and really nice feature of Pandas because you can just simply add your stuff and you keep the correct indices all the time, which is really, really nice. OK, so let's make this, um, just one more second about index alignment. Let's make this data frame. This is just some uh, data frame containing random numbers with the indices. 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And now imagine we wanted to add a new column to this data frame. So let's make a new series. So the series has the same length as our original one and contains all zeros here. Now to add a new column to our original data frame, we would call df and then the new column name equals something. So this would add a new column to our original data frame but change the original one. I don't want to change the original one for demonstration purposes, but I, but I want to create a copy. So I call df.assign, and then new column name equals, and then the series that's supposed to fill the column. Okay? But if I do that, what do I do here? Well, why are these here not a number? Because the indices are not aligned, right? It doesn't simply add first element to first element, second to second, third to third. Then I would get until the last one here, the 19 would have a zero next to it, but it tries to align the indices. So it tells me, well, the second one does have a value for 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, and I can fill that, but the index 11 here, it doesn't occur here, so I can't fill it, so it's not a number. Okay? Um, to show which one, so where the indices actually align, there's um, the method data frame dot align you have to also specify the axis. So let's look where the first one aligns an indices with the second one. And it would tell me, so um, all the ones where I have not a number here are the ones where the indices obviously don't align. So they align for the one, and, this was, and there was this value in the original one. They align for three, and there was this value in the original one. Blah, blah, blah. They align for... Um, uh, for the upper ones, they, uh, yeah, for these, they don't align anymore, but it takes the original value. So it takes the value of the first one. And the second argument um, this returns, uh, the second thing this returns is where, of the second one, where do the indices align? Where they align the first nine ones, and then there are a few ones in the first one which don't occur in the second one, so this is not a number. So this is just for demonstration purposes. What did I want to tell you? Um, well, I wanted to tell you that for the indices to correctly align, I have to provide the same index for a new series. So make a new series of the same length as the original data frame with the same indices as the original data frame. And this results in a series which has the indices 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on and so on. And if I now add the new column there, it aligns it correctly. So this is in place. I just told you. So if I had the dot um, sign, I would create a copy. I changed the original one here. So this creates a new column for my data frame. Indices alignment. OK. Um, then lastly, there's apply. So some function, universal functions are predefined by pandas. And for the ones which are not predefined by pandas, there's the apply function. So imagine I have this data frame and I run df.comsum. Accumulated sum, comsum method exists in pandas, which is why this works. But if it didn't exist, I could simply call df.apply and then this numpy function, and then it would use this numpy function on my pandas data frame. Okay, so these here do the very same in effect. So the comsum method of pandas I can use by simply calling df.comsum, um, and then I 
take um, only the, the results of column A and add that as new column A comes on. And for column B, I imagine there wasn't such a method as df.comsum, so as data frame comes on, but there's only this numpy comes on. And I can call data frame.apply and then the corresponding function. And then, um, yeah, I make that a new column called B, B comes on. Okay, this apply is really useful because apply expects as argument simply a function. And a function are really, really many things. And using lambda functions, I can just put anything in there. So, um, so imagine I wanted to call the sum of all of these. So now I just, for demonstration purposes, so I can make a new lambda function in here, which prints me the sum of whatever it gets in there. Huh? And if I apply that to the entire data set, well, the result of this lambda function is none because the print function doesn't return something, it only prints. But if I apply it, on my data frame, I see that it prints, this is what it prints, the sums of all the columns. So the argument of our function here is always the entire column of the data set. So if I call this lambda function, which prints x dot sum on my data set, I will call the function the first row, on uh, uh, the first column, I mean, um, here where well, printing 91, the second column, print in 441, on the third column, on the second column. Well, and this then returns something. So this is what it prints. This function here doesn't return anything. So what it returns is none, 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 none for all of the columns. So I can apply something to all functions. A more useful thing would be to, for example, um, subtract the max of all, the maximum of all columns by the mean of all columns to get like the, the distance of all columns. And by calling that, so I can simply call df.apply and then make a new function which calculates the distance. And it will take always the highest one minus the smallest one. So 36 here, 216 minus zero here, 91 minus zero here, 441 minus zero here. Okay, so apply to use arbitrary function. Apply works for both data sets, uh, data frames and series. So this here results in a series, right? I take only one column from the data frame. This is series. And I can call my print apply function on there just as well. And I can apply that, um, this function that divides everything, every value of the column. It divides by the maximum of the column A. So what this lambda function does, it first takes the maximum of the column A, which is 36, and then divides everything it gets by 36, such that this A normed, um, if I do that, well, it becomes, so I only want to apply that on this one column, which is a series, which returns a series. This entire thing returns a series. Add the series as a new column, and the series then is the norm. So this is 36 divided by 36, 25 divided by 36, 16 divided by 36, and so on. Yeah. I mean, you can just transpose it, apply the function, then transpose it again. Okay. That's what I would do. Um, yeah. So if you want to do something on the column. But I mean, you could also just uh, call df.log colon, comma, and then whatever what we want to have and apply it on this. Because this here yields a series, right? And then I can apply whatever I want to apply on the series. So apply works on series. However you get your series, doesn't matter. Okay, um, we can even use dictionaries with the apply function. So imagine we had this dictionary of Z moves. Um, so a Z move in Pokemon, yeah, I didn't play that generation, but um, so a Z move, every type has a, spe has a specific Z move. And our Pokemon CSV, right, we wrote the type of all the Pokemon. And the Z move a Pokemon can do, yeah, is depending on its first type. So what I'm going to do here is we want to add which Z move a Pokemon can do as a new column to our data frame. So we have this dictionary of type to whatever the name of the Z move is. They are really stupid names, by the way. And to add that, we can simply use the apply function and make a lambda function here that takes the, our dictionary Z moves at the position 
of, well, our x. And our x is then glass, 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 fire, 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 and so on and so on. So if we apply the dictionary, the, the diction taking an element of this dictionary to glass, 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 fire, 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 this will return in whatever the z move for glass and whatever the z move for fire is. Okay, so if I apply that, I made a new column here, z move. So, so z moves at the position glass is bloom doom, z moves at the position glass, glass is bloom doom, bloom doom, bloom doom, z move at the position fire is inferno overdrive, and so on and so on. So I can use a dictionary to add a new column. Isn't that useful? Okay, um, I can also use apply to convert this uh, list of series into a data frame. So imagine I had this list of series here. So S is, actually that's a series of lists, I'm sorry. Um, so that, uh, so this is, a, this S is a series, as we see it's of type pandas.series. And in there, there are um, lists. And if we apply the constructor for series on every single element of that, we'll make a series out of all out of these lists, right? And that then will result in a data frame because I converted a series of lists into a series of series. And via definition, in pandas, a series of series is nothing but a data frame. Okay, so I converted this into a data frame. Okay, um, now I don't want to have a data frame, but I want to have a flat series. So write a pandas program to convert this series of, no, wait, what was this? Yeah, the series of lists into one flat series. Using the stuff from before here, obviously. So this is really useful for the first step. So as a hint, I said you need the first, you need to apply the series constructor and everything. Oh yeah, I can't show you the hint, the result of the hint, um, because I can only do it once the countdown is done. But yeah, if we stack that, stack was something that converts lists to series or vice versa, so there was something about that. So if we stack that, we see, aha, now we get um, a 
doubly indexed, right? We have this multi-index here. I told you that last uh, Tuesday with this indexing and multi-indexing. And well, once we have that, what we just need to do is we need to reset the index. And if we simply reset the index without any arguments, um, we would get this here. And well, what we could then do is we could um, get the last column here. So it okay, it doesn't work like this. Uh, I could just get the column. It's named zero, right? Is it a string or is it a number? Nobody knows. Ah, okay. No, not like this. Okay, I'm really confused by the indices right now. But um, I am just the same thing as selecting the last column. Ah, I changed it. That's why it didn't work. Okay. Um, same thing is simply then taking the last column is saying, well, everything that used to be an index, you drop. If you look at the pandas documentation of reset index, you see that's a possibility. So we drop everything that used to be an index, and thus we get the series, which is flat. Red, green, white, red, black, yellow. Red, green, white, red, black, yellow. Flat series. OK, coming to our last topic of today, group by pandas is so one really, really useful thing about pandas is the group by. And group by is basically the same as split, apply, combine. So if I group, so I can use group by to um, group pandas series elements um, by, or rather, or also data frames, rather data frames, um, by a certain value. For example, if I wanted from my Pokemon dictionary, I wanted to have all the ones which have as type one grass, I could call my Pokemon data frame dot group by grass. And this would then yield something like um, more, like a few data frames for every single type, it would yield me a data frame containing all the Pokemons of that type. Um, because pandas lazily evaluates that, it's not in fact true, but let's look at how that looks first. So this group by is basically the same as split, apply, combine. So if I group by some value, I split the data into groups based on some criteria, which means I break up and group depending on the value of a key. So if I group by type, it will make me a group grass, a, a group fire, a group water, whatever. Okay. But that alone doesn't help me much. Um, it's possible to use these groups, but it doesn't help me much. If I, want to use, if I want to use group by, I want to apply some function individually. And in group by, I apply this function then to each group independently. For example, aggregation. If I wanted to count the amount of fire Pokemon there are, I would call Pokemon .group, uh, so this Pokemon data frame dot group by type one dot count. And then I would apply this count function to all of these groups. And then in the last step, pandas would combine the results into a data structure for me. Split, apply, combine. So imagine I had my Pokemon dictionary here. So I could now data frame dot group by type one. But just this result in, well, it results in this data frame group by object and not in two individual data frames. This is because it's lazily evaluated. And this is a really useful thing because it makes it way faster. But on this thing here, I can call count. And what this then results in, um, Let's take only like the name. So this makes this makes a series out of my. So this basically takes the column name, which is basically the same as a series, and then I count. And what this does is it splits into Pokemon divided by type one. Then I select only this one column, and then I apply this count function, and this is then applied in every single data frame, 
And then these are the numbers, the results are combined into a new series in this case. Okay, so I get, so I count the numbers of Pokemon which have the type Buck or which have the type Dark and so on and so on. Flying is a really rare type one. And there's only one Pokemon with flying as only type. Okay, um, so how does it look like? Imagine I have this input, I have this ABC, ABC, one, two, three, four, five, six. If I split this by key, key, this is split it into data frames, into smaller data frames, where one where there's only the A ones, one where there's only the B ones, and one where there's only the C ones. We then apply the sum function in this case on the smaller data sets. So one plus four is five, two plus five is seven, three plus six is nine. And we then combine that into a new, uh, into a new data frame. Okay, and this data frame then is basically the combination of these, where the A's collapse into one, the B's collapse into one, and the C's collapse into one. Split, apply, combine. Okay, so if I do that here, um, this is the same as the one here. And um, what do I do here? Well, I first uh, need to convert. So the data type of both columns here is this U21 thingy. Let me convert that into a data, like into a numeric one, such that the uh, this here are numbers. And if I now group them by key, like I said, like I showed you with the Pokemon thingy, I get this data frame group by object. What we turned is not a set of data frames, not a list of data frames, but this data frame group by object. And this is some really nice thing because it allows the same functions. I can still, for example, like I did, take one column of that or call functions on that. Um, but um, the function, the actual computation, doesn't happen until the actual aggregation is applied, which is really useful because it makes the code much faster. And I don't have this, I don't have a set of objects, but simply one object, I call a function on that, and it simply calls that on all its, its small functions, that's um, on all its parts of the set. Really useful thing because it's transparent to the user because I call the same functions on the state, the same methods on this data frame group by object than I would call a normal data frame. Okay, but to we produce a result, we have to aggregate that again. Such as that, I group by some key, I take some aggregation, and in this case, to make it look nicer, I reset the index, because if I don't do that, it has this index, and I don't want to have it like this. Ta-da, really easy. And now this is what I showed you here. So this is the input, created the input like this, very same as the image, and the result of the combination here is this. So I group by the key, I took the sum of all these, and we we set the index to make it look nicer because I want to have it exactly like this. And normally, this, um, this, the indices still have a title. And we can just simply remove that by calling reset index. Uh, yeah. So, group by. Um, if I, so if I only took, so like I said, it also, it also works on series. Uh, no, rather I can. I can um, extract a column from this data frame group by object, which results into a series group by, basically, and I can call the sum of this directory. So column indexing, indexing on this data frame group by object works large, just like on a normal data frame. Okay, um, this data frame group by object is nice and all, but if, what if I want to have the individual groups, actually? What if, I, what if I want to have a data frame containing all the Pokemon of type grass? What I could then do, is I could simply loop over this group by. So this group by, if I loop over it, it yields me a key and a group. And the key is where well, the split key, so if I print all the keys, it's A, B, and C. And if I print all, and I can also just loop over that and print the groups. So the groups are this data frame, the ones where there was an A as the key with the values one and four, this data frame, this data frame. So if you want to actually split and use the groups you can loop over them and make a, a list of data frames out of this. Okay. Um, then dispatching methods. So dispatch methods. Any method which is not implemented by this data frame group by object will simply be passed through and called individually on in all of the groups. Pandas is so nice to us. For example, this describe function exists for data frames. As we see, I showed you on Tuesday. Um, it doesn't exist for this data frame group by object. 
but that doesn't matter to pandas because it then simply calls it individually of all of these underlying um, data frames. So I group by key and then I let them describe. That then yields to key and description of all of these keys for key A. This is a description for key B. This is a description for key C. This is a description. Really nice of pandas to do that for me. Yeah, and if I wanted to know, for example, I showed that already at the end of Tuesday, right, where I made a dictionary out of that. And where did I do it? Somewhere here, I made a dictionary out of the Pokemon data frame. And I expected here, I mean, I didn't. I expected only once from the first generation um, to count. Where were we? Ah, okay, to count um, the Pokemon of each generation, I can group them by generation, then extract only one column to make it a series, and then call number unique, which gives me the number of unique names. And I remember the number of Pokemon in the first and second generation, 151 and 100, that fits. The other one I just believe because I didn't play the generations. Yeah. So this gives me the number of Pokemon for all generations. Okay, one last exercise before we are almost done. Yeah, that was so clear that I couldn't make that in an hour. So imagine we have this countries data set. You have that in the homework as well. And now I want you to look at the region and the population density column. And you were su you're supposed to um, take as argument the data frame containing all these countries and return a series mapping regions. Yeah, regions are listed here to the average population density of the countries in these regions. So what you apparently need to do is you need to group by region and then well, take the average of the population density.
Okay, we never can say I'm done in like half an hour or something. That would just be a lie. Okay, um, so how do we do this? Well, we, like I said, we group by the region. Then we want the column with the population density. And from that, we want the mean. Okay? So this here yields in a series containing the regions and the mean of the corresponding population density. And then I wanted to have this region away, and I wanted to have them sorted such that, let me add this, rename x as none, and sort values as any false. And this then yields a series, which gives me, sorted by population density, the um, regions. Like, whatever region here is doesn't reflect my opinion. I just found it online, blah, blah, all this. OK, um, last two things. Aggregate filter transform and apply. So we focused on aggregation for the combined operation, but there are more options available. Um, group by objects have aggregate filter transform and apply, which are really nice and useful. So let's look at this data frame here. I wrote a function to create it so that I can create it at will. So and this has a key, ABC, ABC, and two columns with values. So we used aggregation functions already. There's also the function aggregate, which is the explicit version of that, which takes then a string, a function, a list of something, and compu computes the aggregates at once. So for example, I can take a list here. I want to aggregate the mean, which is a string corresponding to a function. Um, a NumPy function, or just the name of the method, like uh, uh, the name of the function itself, everything works. And if I do that, well, I make a new data frame, which for the, so we see there's a double index here. There's the index data, and that has then the mean, the max, and the median, and the max, and data two. So this column was converted into a new one, mean, median, max, and this one was converted to mean, median, max. And I aggregate the mean, the median, and the max in there. Okay? So this performed the mean aggregation, the median aggregation, and the max aggregation on both of these columns and made a data frame containing these as columns. So I can do all these aggregations at once using my aggregate keyword. Okay, what's also useful, for example, is to pass a dictionary mapping column names to operations to be applied on that column. So, like I said, this data frame here has a column data one and data two, and I can tell if I provide a dictionary's argument, well, do min with the column data one and do max with the column data two. And this then results in a data frame which does the min operation on the first column, so the mean of these values here is zero, and the max of these values here is nine, so, um, oh wait, the mean of, sorry, of zero and, uh, of zero and three here, yeah, is zero, and the max of five and three is five. So the result of this for the key A would be zero and five. The key A is zero and five, and for the key B and C it's uh, um, obviously something else. Okay, so apply uh, can give a list, can give a dictionary, really useful. Next, filter. Filtering allows me to drop data based on the group properties. So if I wanted to keep all the groups in which a standard deviation, uh, in which a standard deviation is larger than some value, we can make a function for that. This filter function takes as argument um, a data frame, extracts this column from that, and well, applies the standard deviation um, uh, aggregation function on this column yeah, and checks if that is bigger than four. So it takes a data frame and checks if the standard deviation of the column data two is bigger than four. That's what this function does, this filter func does. And let's look at our data frame again. So the standard deviation of where key is A, is five and three, where they are pretty close together, it should be smaller than four. For column B, it's of zero and seven. They differ by pretty much, maybe that's a standard deviation bigger than four. And then we have three and nine. Um, well, I don't know how much they differ, let's look at it. So, 
the standard deviation of the first one is 1.4, smaller than 4, the second one is 4.9, bigger than 4, and the third one is 4.2, bigger than 4. And if we now group by key and then filter using our function, yeah, we get this data frame which removed all the rows which have as key A because they didn't correspond to our filter function. So if I group by and then filter, the result is not an aggregate. The result has the same shape of the original data frame. We just left the lines out which did not correspond to our filter, the ones where the standard deviation is not bigger than 4. Okay? Filter. Group by and filter. And then lastly, apply lets you apply an arbitrary function to the group results. Okay, so we had apply on normal data frames before. So imagine, so remember this one, which um, applied this lambda function, which divided the series which was put in there by the maximum of the this column, which then well normed basically this data one column, right? Because this used to be um, five divided by five. 4 divided by 5, 3 divided by 5, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, so what if we wanted to normalize the grouped first column by the sum of the grouped second? Okay, so the sum of the grouped second for A would be 5 plus 3 would be 8. For B it would be O plus 7 would be 7. For C it would be 3 plus 9 would be 12. Now, we wanted to normalize this first column by this sum, respectively. So we wanted to normalize this 0 by 8. 0 divided by 8. This here is a b. So this 0.2, we want to divide by 7. This is a c. This is 0.4, we want to divide by 12. This is an a again. This is 0.6, we want to divide by 8. This is 0.8, we want to divide by 7. And this 1.0, we want to divide by 12. Okay. So if we did that without our group by apply function, this is what it would need to look like. Okay, we had. So uh, let's calculate the sums at first. Let's use a group by for that. So we calculate the grouped sum of the lower of the last column, eight, seven, and twelve. I told you that already. Okay, and if we didn't use this um, apply on our group by object, we needed to loop over all of our groups here and then divide our data here by what we just calculated, getting it out of the series here, and then make a new data frame where we append the results. Okay, so if we execute this loop over and over again, at first it will take all the A's, divide them by eight, and this is the result. Then we take all the B's, divide them by this seven, this is the, and append that to our data frame, uh, append, and then the same for the C's. And it would also give me a warning because I did something which I uh, shouldn't. But the result is correct. Um, but uh, there's an easier way to do that, and that's using apply on this group by. Okay, so imagine, um, so for that we make this function norm by data two. And this takes as input a data frame of group values. Hmm. Why? Okay, tight. It's dead. It does the correct thing. Hello? Oh, that's so unfortunate. Okay, I don't know how to fix this. Everything just died.
shit. <laughs> Only on the one, but that's fine for me. Aha! Yeah, okay. So, this function takes a data frame, and then I make a new column, like a data one. I replace the column, uh, the original contents, by dividing it of the sum of data two. So, if I applied that on the entire data frame, I would divide by the sum of all of data two, and not of the group ones, but I can simply group by key and then apply that function and then that yields to the correct result. Okay, I'm almost done, very last thing, real quick. I specify the split key, so um, we split the data frame so far on a single column name. This is just one of many options. I can also um, do other things. For example, I can split by a list, an array, a series, or an index providing grouping keys. So Imagine the, this is still our data frame. Now I wanted to group by this list. So I don't group by the key here, but I group by, well, I group this one um, is group zero, this one is group zero, and the last one is group zero. And then one is here and here, so the second and the fourth one, so indexes one and zero are group one, and number four, is only the only member of group two. So I would expect for then the resulting data set, I would result for two, I would expect 0 0.8 and 7. And yeah, for one, I would expect the, um, what is it, zero and three, and the sum of three and three, yeah, that's correct, and the sum of 0.2 and 0.6. So I can specify a list as the split key instead of the column name. And I can also, for example, and this is the very last thing for today, I can provide a dictionary that maps index values to the group keys. So look at my data frame again here. I set now um, the key to um, as the index. Now I have a mapping, which is simply a dictionary telling me A is a vowel, B is a consonant, C is a consonant. And I can also group by this mapping. And now it will group um, the Bs and Cs together because they're both consonants, right? So everything under A is now vowel, so the sum of data two would be eight for A for the vowels, that's true. And then the sum of B and C would be zero plus three plus seven plus nine, 19, which is the correct thing. Yeah, I can also group by multiple columns. So I can first group by mapping and under that, inside that group by key, which then forms a hierarchical index again. So I can group by the first consonant and then B and C, and that then groups it with the hierarchical index. Okay, as much, what pandas the first lecture? Wow, this took again longer than expected. Let's look at the homework for a second because I still want to explain that. Group. So this is this week's homework. So you're supposed to work with two different data sets. First of all, the Pokemon data set for one task and the countries data set for two tasks. So um, this is the link where this countries data set is coming from and where in the zero task is supposed to make a set counted with the data set. So look at the data set, print the value count to see what the data set contains. Then you're supposed to find the non-G20 country with the highest GDP. Okay, so there's another in the data module, yeah, so this G G20, which contains the names of all G20 countries. Additionally, the EU is considered a G20 country, so there's um, a column for if a country is in the EU or not. And you're supposed to hear div that country, which is a non-G20 country, which is one which is not in the list of G20 countries and not in the EU. You can use master for that, obviously. And then get the if this, the country which the, with the highest GDP, which is, does not correspond to that filter. Okay. Um, then information about continents. Actually, let me show you that in a bit. I can't increase the font size of the formatted one, which is a bit shitty. But, so let's look at the unformatted page. Okay, so um, 
one column of the data set represents subcolumns, and then there's a continents of CSV file which translates the subcontinents to continents. You're supposed to write this function continent data frame, which is supposed to yield this very thing here. So you're supposed to give the continent the continents ordered by population, you're supposed to give the sum of the population of all these countries in the continent as well as the number, the count of countries which are in this continent. Okay? Sorted by the continent population. So apply may be used in combination with the dictionary, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, again, this doesn't reflect my opinion. I just found it online. It's arguably this of all countries, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. So um, this is just something I thought. And then as last task, let's come back to the Pokemon data set. Um, let me explain that real quick because I think maybe not too understandable if you don't know Pokemon. Um, so you're supposed to find the Pokemon with the best stats that can best defend the most common type combination there is. Okay, so we had our Pokemon data frame here and the Pokemon all had, oh, this is not the Pokemon data frame, the Pokemon all had a type 1 and type 2. So a type combination yeah, is um, well, a Pokemon that has two types, whereas poison, for example, this is like a type combination, okay? And then, in the first step, you need to figure out the most common type combination there is. And I only want type combinations, not single types. I think the most common type combination, including single types, would be water nothing. The most common type combination is normal flying, okay? So, whatever, the, so you need to find the most common type combination, normal flying. So, pitch it and stuff. Pitch it, pitch it. Okay? And then, yeah, after finding that, um, you have this common type one, like imagine you said the variable common type one and common type two, flying, uh, normal flying. And then you need to look at this effectivity table, which is also given with a CSV, yeah? and it's coming from here, this is where I have this open. Okay, so this is an effectivity table. Yeah? So this is the defender Pokemon, and this is the attacker Pokemon. And this is how effective it is. Okay, so imagine a Pokemon of type fire, which means fire, tries to attack a Pokemon of type water. Yeah? This is only half effective because fire against water is not effective. And vice versa, it's very effective. So if the Pokemon of type water tries to fight a Pokemon of type fire, yeah, this is very effective because water is good against fire. Yeah? And now, in the first step, you figured out the most common type combination. And now you want to figure out the types which are most effective against these types. So I said normal flying, and there are two types which are very effective against normal as well as very effective against flying, okay? Then you need to figure out these two types, and you need to figure out a Pokemon, all the Pokemon which have these two types. Um, the types are steel and uh, rock. And then you need to simply find this Pokemon of type steel and rock with the highest total stats, which is Agron. So I told you the solution already. Um, so you can just select the line where it says Agron and return that, um, but you could also try to figure that out like this. So I gave you this build-up and simulation. So Agron is the Pokemon you want to have with you if you don't want to be attacked by Pidgeys all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, I want to have a new task in the, in the frame up again. Okay, good. That would be it. I hope you can do that, and I hope I explained it well enough. All right, thank you then.